Let us pray. God, we are grateful for this wonderful account from the Gospel of John of the work of Jesus on behalf of his friends, of his sharing in their grief and doing something about it. We pray that you would give us your spirit as we continue the story and that we might leave here today knowing how this story touches us. In Jesus Christ we pray, amen. I appreciate Scott taking the lion's share of this very long chapter. Um, as we did with the woman at the well, uh, the story is so long that it, it kind of becomes the whole scripture for the morning. I encourage you to finish the chapter as the rest of the story is told what impact Jesus raising Lazarus has uh, that eventually leads to his arrest and crucifixion and death. Let us pick up the story in verse 38. Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench. He has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you? that if you believed, you would see the glory of God. So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I was coming into my own faith as a young person, having been raised in the church and kind of borrowing my parents' faith all that time, when I began to question, what did this mean for me? How was I going to practice this faith? I remember that I was awed and amazed by God the Creator everything majestic and the creation in nature, and I felt very um, inspired and close to God, the creator. I remember feeling inspired and, and moved by the Holy Spirit. You could tell when, when something would come to you and you knew it was a, a gift from the Holy Spirit. The one member of the Trinity that I had the most trouble with was, you guessed it, Jesus, the Son of the Father, the Lord, the Messiah, the Christ, our Savior. I remember when I was on youth retreats or at camp, and the leader would, would say, okay, we're going to have a guided meditation now. So close your eyes, everyone, and, and imagine that you're at the beach. You're walking along the sand and the sunshine, and you see a, a figure coming towards you. The figure walks closer and closest to you, and you realize that this figure is Jesus. Imagine that Jesus comes close to you, arm's length. Imagine, what does he look like? What does he sound like? What does he say to you? What does he want from you? What's it like to be that close to Jesus? And with my eyes closed, I came up blank. I didn't know. I didn't know what this Jesus, this man, would be like. I thought, well, he's too young to be like my father. He's not a father figure. I had only a sister, so I didn't know what it was like to have a brother, so I 
know if he'd be like a brother. An uncle, maybe. Certainly not a boyfriend. I couldn't imagine Jesus like that. I didn't know how Jesus would approach me or talk to me. And I felt sad. What kind of a Christian was I if I didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus, if I didn't know what he would look like and how he would talk to me? Jesus is, as you might know, in the world of religions, a curious and unique figure. As Christians, we proclaim that he is fully human and fully divine. Theologians and scholars have exhausted themselves trying to figure out how this can be, trying to describe what is this union, this entity, that one could be human and divine. They've thrown many words at it, substance, essence, person. What they came up with is a Greek word, hypostasis. Neither can preachers pin down exactly what a hypostasis means, but we say the union of Christ's humanity and divinity in one hypostasis. We don't know how to describe it exactly. We just know that it is a cornerstone of our faith. In John's Gospel, chapter 11, we are gifted with a story that really brings it home, this union of divine and human. The account of Mary, Martha, Lazarus, and Jesus is, according to one commentator, a climactic text in the Gospel of John, a climactic story. Emotionally, relationally, this is a climax in John's Gospel. The sisters send a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Jesus loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus. Our friend Lazarus, Jesus refers to him. When Jesus finally arrives at his friend's home and sees Mary and Martha, he is greatly disturbed in spirit, the Pew Bibles say. The NIV says, moved in spirit and troubled. Other translations say agitated, angry even. And Jesus begins to cry. Do you know that feeling? Of grief that is a mixture of distress and trouble, agitation and even anger? The people in the crowd marvel, see how he loved him. What a friend is Jesus. Friend is an image of Jesus that allowed me to connect with him. As a woman, as a mother, a minister, a counselor, a friend is what I need what we all need, a friend who accompanies us, who stays with us, who walks beside us when all others fade away. Yet the gospel story doesn't end there. It could, with Jesus and his friends weeping over the loss of Lazarus whom they loved. But this is not the end of the story. Jesus, through tears, arrives at the tomb where his friend has been interred. Take away the stone, he directs. Martha is reluctant and protests, but the bystanders do as Jesus says. Then he prays, talking to his father out loud so that all around can hear I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may know that you have sent me. Lazarus, come out. When I came to know Jesus as friend, 
I felt comforted and joined somehow in daily life with all its highs and lows and stresses. But this was not enough. As much as I love the gospel accounts of Jesus eating with sinners and welcoming outcasts and revealing himself to women as well as men, the humanity of Jesus is not enough. Earlier in John's Gospel and in the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus remains more aloof. He does not allow his disciples to tell of the wonders that he has done. He goes alone away from them to pray on a hillside. But here in John 11, Jesus is all in. If we wonder, does God know the pit I'm in? Does God see the brokenness all around? We have only to read this scripture to proclaim, yes, yes, God sees, God knows, God weeps with us. Because Jesus weeps with us. The son of the father grieves with his friends that their brother and his friend has died. Any tomb we stand beside, Jesus stands with us. But, Father, I thank you for having heard me, Jesus calls out. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so they may believe that you sent me. Lazarus, come out. In recent weeks, the Disciple Sunday School class has had several lively debates about the miracles that Jesus did, the feeding of the 5,000, raising Jairus' daughter from death, and here, Lazarus. In both instances, Jesus says they have only fallen asleep. And there was some debate among the bystanders. Are they asleep? What does that mean? Does that mean they're actually dead? Here, John makes note that four days have passed since Lazarus' death, as if to certify that Lazarus has truly died. At Jesus calling him, the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, his face covered in a cloth. Unbind him, Jesus says, and let him go. Jesus is far more than friend. He says as much in the fifth of seven I am statements in the Gospel of John, echoing that word of God in Genesis, I am. I am who I am. Tell them, I am sent you. Here Jesus declares to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. I am. I am. Lazarus was but one person brought back from the dead, and his was a resuscitation that would one day end again in death. But through the work of Christ, our Savior, the door to eternal life in the realm of God has been opened for us. Now, when we stand at the grave of a loved one, we know Christ our friend and Christ our Savior stands with us and shall bring us to be with him forever. Friend helped me connect with Jesus. Friend may be an image that our neighbors who do not know much about Christian faith might be able to identify with. Friend is what a vast number in this world yearn for. We know that isolation is rampant among young people as well as older adults. St 
Studies of loneliness tell us that as many as 80% of those under age 18 and at least 40% of those over 65 report being lonely at least sometimes. And this was before the pandemic. Loneliness we describe as perceived social isolation, not objective social isolation. That is to say, we may be surrounded by all kinds of people, but we do not feel connected to them. We may have many acquaintances, but few real friends. Many factors contribute to this, but it seems to me as a faith community, we hold a treasure of being a place and a network in which people can be befriended and can befriend others. And most of all, we can together worship our divine yet human savior friend. How might our fellowship grow wider and deeper so that as Park Lake we become known as a place of great faith, a place of great food, a place of great friends. We know from our mission study through vital congregations that identified loneliness and social isolation as a, a high priority, if not number one, among our neighborhood and our community around Park Lake. Later in John's Gospel, Jesus says, I do not call you servants any longer because servants don't know what the master is doing. I have called you friends. I have called you friends. Friends of the great I am, Jesus, our savior friend. Praise the Lord, amen.